And welcome to the day the sun stands still. Uh, I'm Phyllis Coldye, a writer and poet coming to you from Brookings, South Dakota. And if you listen carefully, you might hear the wind howling around the eaves of my house. It's good to have you all with us. For those of us in the Northern Hemisphere, this is the winter solstice, the shortest day and the longest night of the year. As we gather this evening around an imaginary fire, we're in peak darkness. Tomorrow though, our days will start to slowly lengthen, promising the return of spring and the reawakening of the world after a deep sleep. I am very happy this evening to be joined by two wonderful poets and wonderful human beings, I might add, Rosemary Tromer and James Cruz. I want to thank them very much for being part of this. And we hope that by the end of the evening, we will have given you a renewed sense of purpose and belonging ready for whatever challenges lie ahead. We have just a little bit of housekeeping to do before we start. And uh, forgive me if I'm a little bit preoccupied by people still coming into the, uh, the event. The first thing I'd like to say is that uh, you are muted by default. And um, I thought your video was also going to be off, but here you are. I don't know what happened, but it's good to see your faces anyway. Um, if you have any technical problems uh, during the course of the event, just uh, put it in the chat box and we'll do our best to try to help you, okay? Uh, next, um, the last 10, 15 minutes of the event, we'll be having a question and answer time. And so if you have any questions or comments, uh, for us during the course of the hour, just uh, put those in the chat and we will address as many of those as we can before the end of the event, okay? Uh, this event is being recorded. And so tomorrow you're going to receive a really special email. Um, for one thing, you will be getting the link to that recording. And also you'll be getting a link to a gift package, which will uh, contain all the materials that we're using tonight and then some. So I hope that uh, you'll enjoy that, that uh, gift uh, package that you'll receive. Please be watching just in case that goes to your spam box or your junk mail, okay? Ah, at this point, I'm going to light my candle and invite you to draw a little closer to the fire here under the evergreen tree, the tree of life. Got everybody coming into the circle. Hopefully everybody is there. And so now through stories, and poems and songs will reflect together on this transition between darkness and light. Rosemary, would you like to start us off? Night goes back to where it was. Everyone returns home sometime. Night goes back to where it was. Everyone returns home sometime. Night, when you get there, tell them how I love you. Night, when you get there, tell them how I love you. Those words are by Rumi, and the song is sung by Libana, a wonderful women's a cappella group. 
And uh, I thought when I was so excited, thank you, Phyllis, for having this amazing idea. And I thought it would be fun for us to start our program tonight in a celebration of the dark. Um, on this time when there is so much of it, uh, what, what a gift to really steep ourselves in it, to really know ourselves as part of it. Uh, not just to push it away and, and run racing toward the light that's coming, although that's exciting. But I, I, I fell deeply, deeply, deeply in love with the dark, oh, about eight, nine years ago. And the poem that I wanted to recite for you next is part of the reason why. And it's such a beautiful invitation from Rainer Maria Rilke. This is you, darkness, that I come from. You darkness that I come from. I love you more than all the fires that fence in the world for the fire makes a circle of light for everyone but then no one outside learns of you. But the darkness pulls in everything, shapes and fires, animals and myself, how easily it gathers them, powers and people. And it is possible a great energy is moving near me. I have faith in nights. That poem changed everything about the darkness for me. It, and I was having, I was in a, a dark night of the soul moment and it allowed me to lean more deeply into it, to fall in love with that. So uh, mostly I'll be sharing some poems that help us fall in love with the dark. This is Clear Night and it's the first poem actually in my new book, Hush. Clear Night. I ask the night Teach me to ask bigger questions. It replies, hmm, perhaps you could take the pen away from the one who wants to ask questions and then let her come walk in the night. Mm -hmm. Um, I just finished teaching a Mary Oliver class where we read a lot of her poems from Devotions. I see several of you who are in that class here. Hi, friends. Thanks for coming. And um, she has a beautiful poem, in fact, an entire gorgeous book called Why I Wake Up Early. And uh, I... I'm the opposite. I've always wondered if it's because I was born at 2.32 in the morning that I seem to come most alive right around 2.30 in the morning. And I'm, that's when I get really excited about making things and I'm, I feel so much a part of the world then. This is why I stay up late. So gently the darkness curls around the world, first dusky, then dim, then lushly black. So generous the way it thickly spreads the softest of songs until silence silks the empty streets and velvets the vacant rooms. Even this riotous heart inclines toward quietude. And whatever part of me that knows something yawns. And the part of me who falls in love with mystery leans more easily into the ever unknown. And I meet the starry grand embrace speck that I am and marvel at my insignificance, marvel at how enormous it is, this openness, this gratitude. Night goes back to where it was. All this worry about how to paint the light. So there's a, a poem by, oh, I'm spacing his name, who used to have uh, City Lights Bookstore in San Francisco, Ferlinghetti. 
and he has this poem about you know painting the light and it's all about how to how to paint the light and i thought well what about this teach me to paint the dark the infinite shades of the infinite dark, the basis of all the light that is, the origin, the ink bright spark that leaps from the great black well, the darkling spring, the raven luck, the mother from which the big bang sprang, the womb of dawn, the only cloak measureless enough to hold everything everything in its folds. Teach me to paint the inner midnight, the moonless rooms, the lavish corners, the mighty dark inside the fist, the vastness of limitless space that links everything with no effort. The everything that is and the everything that ever was and the everything that ever will be. Teach me the song of soil, the song of deep winter, the pure dark song of the sea. All the dark that's been terrorized by light and all the dark that's been pushed away and all the dark that's been feared, teach me its valor, its ferocity. It's kindness, it's gentleness, it's blinding generosity. Um, this time of year is called the, 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 the fortnight. Isn't that a fancy glorious word, fortnight? Uh, <laughs> I said it on the phone the other night to my friend and uh, I said to her that, that for the last fortnight, my son had not taken a shower and he, you know, he's 16 and he got the biggest kick out of this that it had been a whole fortnight since he'd been clean. Uh, well, that's enough about that, I suppose. But um, the Halcyon time is a fortnight around the solstice and it's supposed to be a time of great peace. Uh, it is somewhat of an oxymoron perhaps this year and also I think still available to us, this great piece. Um, the other meaning, there's many meanings I suppose for Halcyon, but another one is just a time that we go back to and remember, oh, that was such a wonderful time. This is these Halcyon days and it begins with my favorite lines of poetry that have ever been written. The, someone asked in an interview once, what? What lines do you wish? What poem do you wish you had written? And these are from A.R. Ammons. It comes from Gravelly Run. And he says, for it is not so much to know the self as to know it as it is known by galaxy and cedar cone. I want to know the self the way a nest might know the egg it holds, the way a feather might know a wing. I want to know the self as a bank knows a river, as a wave knows a wave, as night knows night. There is a kind of knowing that has less to do with certainty and more to do with meeting the world again and again exactly as it is. I want to know the self with no name, no story as a stone might know it or a song. I have just one more poem and then a song um, and then I'll be passing it over to Phyllis Coldeye. Uh, and this is a poem I wrote in September. I think for many of us this this whole chapter, this strange chapter that we find ourselves in globally has been, um, I myself have felt a real longing for, for light, for clarity, for, for goodness. And um, so this poem I wrote last September and it's in times of great darkness, I want to do for you what the sun does for me coax you to come outside, to breathe in 
the golden air. I want to warm you and enter you, fill you with brilliance. Make your muscles melt, make your mind. I want to prepare for you luminous paths that span across deep space. Thaw any part of you that feels frozen. Find any cracks and slip shine into them. I want to intensify your shadow so you might better know your own shape. I want to encourage you to open wider, wider, to teach you to write your name in light. I do wish all of us <laughs> light. As much as I love this darkness, I wish for all of us that kind of clarity, that kind of light, that kind of brilliance and luminosity and feeling lit up from within, radiant. Um, I'm going to close with this song. The lyrics are from uh, a woman named Sarah Williams and her poem, The Astronomer, and the tune comes from Joseph Haydn. Though my soul may set in darkness, it will rise in perfect light. I have loved the stars too fondly to be fearful of the night, fearful of the night. Though my soul may set in darkness. Thank you so much, Rosemary. So many gifts you bring to the darkness and to the light. Thank you. I want to begin with a, a very simple poem called Candle. In the dark, in the cold, you burn. Not trying to give light, just being light. Not trying to give warmth, just being warmth, not regretting, not fretting, not grasping, not holding back, not needing a sermon or a reason, not hoping for thanks or wanting praise, not fearing puffs of breath, or drops of water, or even the snuffer's cone. Just dancing where you stand, as candles do. A little wick, a pillar of wax, fire till your burning's through. In the beginning, there was only light and dark. The people lived on the earth as we do now, but during the day, the sky was bright white, no clouds, no blue, just white. And at night, the sky was completely black, no stars, no moon, just black. And because this was the way the world was, you always stayed home. If you were ever caught far from your village when the sky went dark, you were never heard from again. So people lived their entire lives in the same place, knowing the same people. And while they said that they were happy enough living this way in their heart of hearts, they longed to see what they couldn't see, to meet the people they suspected were out there somewhere, but couldn't meet. Yet despite their longings, they accepted that 
this was how the world had always been and how it would always be. Then a girl came into the world and this girl loved the world so much. During the white sky hours, she'd romp and play as she wandered with her mother gathering food for the family. And in the black sky hours, she would listen to her father's stories about the sights he saw while hunting around the village. And each night before she fell asleep, she'd say to her mother, Mama, I want to visit other places. Please, will you take me? Can we go? And every night, her mother would say, oh, honey, we can't. It isn't safe. The world's too dark. We'd get lost and never return. But night after night, her daughter asked, mama, can we go? And you know how children are, how their dreams can creep into your heart and become your dreams too. And one night when her daughter said for the gazillionth time, please, mama, her mother said, I'll think about it. And she did. She thought for days as she gathered grasses and roots and berries to eat. She thought as she sat talking with the other women and as she listened to her husband's stories, she thought as she wove reeds into baskets and as she thatched the roof of their house. And one night while sitting with her family, gazing into the fire, she had an idea. She got up and she mixed water and clay and she made a pot from the mud and then she made a lid for the pot and she placed these things in the fire to bake until they were as hard as stone. And when the fire began to die out, she scooped up a pot full of embers and covered it with the lid. And she lay down beside her daughter and her daughter said, Mama, can we go? Can we go? I'm still thinking, the woman said. In the morning, she lifted the lid to look inside the pot and the embers were still glowing red. So that night when her daughter said, please mama, are you done thinking yet? Can we go? The woman said, yes. In the morning we will go. Now close your eyes. The faster you go to sleep, the faster morning will come. As soon as the sky was white again, this mother and daughter packed up as much food and water as they could carry. They said their goodbyes. And then the woman took up her pot full of embers and the two of them started walking. They walked and they walked until the sky started to turn black. And then they stopped and they collected a little pile of twigs and sticks and the mother poured her embers on them and soon they had a blazing fire. And when the sky was black, black, they sat around their fire, huddled as close as they could. And from the darkness beyond the little ring of light came the growling and the howling and the prowling animals. And the mother held her daughter tight. Just before they fell asleep, she put some live coals from the fire into her pot. They woke up when the sky was white again. The woman dropped a few twigs into the pot to feed the embers and then she and her daughter began to walk. And as they walked under the white, white sky, they sang songs and they told stories. And just before the world went black, black again, they built another fire and they huddled close, listening to the night sounds and watching the sparks fly up. And then the woman had an idea. With the lid of her pot, she scooped up some coals from the fire and she flung them toward the sky as far as she could. She was very strong. And those embers flew higher and higher until they stuck fast in the black. And it was very good. So the woman tossed up another lid full of embers, this time back in the direction of their village. And those embers also stuck to the black. 
Well, now her daughter wanted to try. And small as she was, even she could send those embers flying. And before long, the way home was twinkling over half the sky. Well, morning after morning, the mother and daughter continued their journey. And every night, they would cast more embers up into the sky, which was still black, black, but sparkling as it never had before. And they knew they would never get lost. After weeks of walking, they reached a village. The people there were astonished to see them. How did you ever get here? How did you not vanish in the dark nights? And the woman and her daughter showed the villages the pot of coals. And as soon as the world went black, they pointed out the path they had painted across the night sky. Here, they said to the villagers, use the lid of our pot to throw some embers from your fires into the sky above us. And the villagers did. The next day, the mother and daughter moved on. And as they went, they always painted a shimmering path above them. And everywhere they went, the people they met tossed embers from their fires into the night sky. And so it is that we learn how to light the way home for one another. That story is my version of a story that I first heard Laura Packer tell. Let me just make sure nobody has signed in. Okay, I don't um, have a story yet about how the moon came to be in the sky. Maybe one of you does, but I do have a poem called What the Moon Said. What the Moon Said. You can go away and come back without ever leaving. Sometimes you must shrink to grow. You have many faces that are true. Sometimes you must repeat yourself to be fully understood. Darkness is light waiting its turn. Sometimes you best reveal yourself in slivers. Your hidden influence alters worlds. Sometimes you're undervalued until you disappear. Even when you seem gone, you're there. This is a uh, poem by Susan Cooper called The Shortest Day. I believe this is uh, an illustrated children's book, but this is just the text I'm going to share with you. And so the shortest day came and the year died. And everywhere down the centuries of the snow white world came people singing, dancing to drive the dark away. They lighted candles in the winter trees. They hung their homes with evergreen. They burned beseeching fires all night long to keep the year alive. And when the new year's sunshine blazed awake, they shouted, reveling. 
through all the frosty ages. You can hear them echoing behind us. Listen. All the long echoes sing the same delight this shortest day as promise wakens in the sleeping land. They carol, feast, give thanks, and dearly love their friends and hope for peace. And now, so do we here now this year every year welcome you all james my friend would you like to step up absolutely thank you so much for all the beauty rosemary and phyllis both um, it's such an honor to be here with both of you and to be among all of you who are sharing this space with us. It's, it is indeed a very special time of year and um, a special time in the history of the world. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about how the world seems very broken right now. And, um, you know, in my darker moments, I, I can wonder, you know, what what can I give to that or, or how can I add to that? Um, and I think what we can do um, most of all is just give of ourselves completely and be as vulnerable and exposed as, as we all feel sometimes. And so this poem that I'd like to begin with is really about vulnerability. It's about showing our cracks and our so-called flaws to other people, because I believe that that's how we connect. And I, I think that we are actually more connected as a world um, than we ever have been as a result of everything that's going on, even as we have to physically distance ourselves. And um, the title of this poem is Kintsugi which is a Japanese practice of filling the cracks in a piece of ceramic with pure gold. The word kintsugi actually means golden joinery, which is a lovely phrase. Um, and so this is kintsugi. Anyone who loves someone else already has a broken heart. It's the law. If you want that light to flood your body, you must expose the cracks through which it pours, since they are the source of your beauty and your strength. Think of the Japanese who fill the cracks in a ceramic bowl with pure gold, not only flaunting those so-called flaws, but also making each one a priceless vein through which light now moves. And I also wanted to share with all of you a poem. This is the title poem from my book, Telling My Father. And um, I, I wanna share this poem because it is a poem of grief. Um, and in part, because I believe that in order to find the light, we have to honor the dark and the difficult and certainly the losses that uh, we've all had in our lives that we might be having right now. Um, I'm thinking of this poem too, especially because it was almost 20 years ago to the day that we lost my father at, at the very young age of 43. And, um, and this was a moment that came to me years later. It was quite a gift when I remember this moment. It was after I had gone out and uh, spent most of the night away, um, probably worrying my parents to death, um, and then came home and felt this moment of pure just acceptance and embrace from my father, who I, I was never actually able to come out to. I just uh, wasn't able to have that moment with him. And then years later, I realized we did have the moment. It just didn't happen the way I thought it would. 
And so this is telling my father. I found him on the porch that morning, sipping cold coffee, watching a crow dip down from the power line into the pile of black bags stuffed in the dumpster where he pecked and snagged a can tap, then carried it off, clamped in his beak like the key to a room only he knew about. My father turned to me then, taking in the reek of my smoke, traces of last night's eyeliner, I decided not to wipe off this time. Out late was all he said, and then smiled, rubbing the small of my back through the robe for a while before heading inside, letting the storm door click softly shut behind him. Later, when I stepped into the kitchen, I saw it waiting there on the table, a glass of orange juice he had poured for me and left, sweating in a patch of sunlight so bright, I couldn't touch it at first. And so a lot of the people who know me, uh, I, I know Rosemary knows this because it's come up in other readings, but uh, they know that I'm slightly obsessed with orchids um, and mainly orchids that I can rescue from other people who are just giving them away or throwing them away. Uh, my first orchid I found on the side of the, of the street in Providence, Rhode Island, and I rescued it and brought it back home. And uh, since then, my husband and I have accumulated a little bit of an orchid hospital that lives in the living room with us uh, next to the wood stove, very conveniently for the orchids. Um, and so I have a couple of orchid poems for you and they seem to just, come up. James, I have to tell people, he even, yeah. he rescues orchids that don't even have leaves on them. There's like, <laughs> they're not even leaves and he brings them back. It's, it's a true rescue mission. It's, this is like rescuing crows, isn't it? <laughs> It's true. We also feed the crows who live on our farm here. So <laughs> yes, <clears throat> we try to be as generous as possible. But uh, this, this is about the orchid that tends to bloom uh, around the new year every year. And, um, and this first one uh, was written right after uh, the last presidential election. And so you can imagine uh, the mood in which this was put down. This is darkest before dawn. Three days into the new year, and despite the lack of adequate light, our white Philanopsis orchid has eased open a third delicate bloom. Perhaps coaxed by the warmth of the wood stove just a few feet away, the orchid thrives in its tiny pot shaped like the shell of a nautilus, sending out new stems and glossy leaves, its aerial roots green at the tips, reaching upward like tentacles to sip the morning air. These blooms stir something too long asleep in me, proving with stillness and slow growth what I haven't wanted to believe these past few months that hope and grace still reign in certain sectors of the living world, that there are laws which can never be overturned by hateful words or the wishes of power-hungry men. Be patient, this orchid seems to say, and reveal your deepest self in the middle of winter, even in the darkness before the coming dawn. And so I, I couldn't stop myself from writing another uh, New Year poem now that the, the last presidential election has finished. Um, and so this one is just called New Year. Even our orchid looks forward to the coming year as it sends yet another stem up against the window. 
as if bowing toward that one reliable source of light. As soon as its former winged white blossoms begin to shrivel, we see four more buds forming on the new stem, ready to bloom as the clock strikes midnight, and we leave this tattered ear far behind, ready to show us how to allow our hearts to unfold petal by petal for no reason other than a voice deep inside tells us we must keep giving ourselves to this world, no matter how broken it seems, letting all the now useless parts of us fall to the floor without fanfare, with no regrets as we open again to the months of light to come. And so I also believe um, in honoring as much as we can the, those difficult times in our, in our lives, uh, times of depression, deep anxiety. Um, if you're anything like me, you've gone through the whole spectrum, uh, especially during this last year. And I do my best not to escape from these feelings, to know that the longer I stay with them, as long as there's something, not, something more serious that, that isn't wrong, um, the more I stay with them, um, the stronger I am as a person, and the more I'm able to weather even larger storms that come along in life. And so this poem is called Stay, which was actually uh, inspired by a poem by uh, Ingrid Goff Madoff, who um, has been a student of Rosemary's as well as mine. And um, the part of the poem that inspired this poem was on a postcard that Rosemary sent me a few months back. So how's that for coming full circle? <laughs> so this is Stay, beginning with a line from Ingrid Goff Madoff. Stay with this, there is no escape. Though your heart aches and the world shrunk to the size of these few rooms, though fear plucks the strings of each nerve and you want nothing more than to burst free of the casing of your own mind, like a bittersweet berry offering its softer self to overwintering birds. Still, dawnlight breaks blue above the swaying maples, and the space heater kicks on, steaming windows with its warm, constant breath. Stay with this and it will pass through, like a sudden storm whose sole purpose is to scatter leaves, seeds, and spores, each to find a new home. The wind cuts terribly against the skin of your face as you press on. Remember, it will calm and cease, but not before carrying off all that you no longer need. So I think at this point, we will open it up to any questions that you might have, anything that you'd like to ask us about uh, the writing life or uh, what you just heard tonight. I'm so glad, James, that you ended with that poem. I saw that you'd put it on Facebook today and um, it felt so right, the, the honoring of how it is just to stay, to stay with what's difficult. And then that image of the, of the ripening berry, it just seems to hold it so perfectly. Yeah, thank you for that. I'm glad to hear it in your voice. It's so different, isn't it, to hear a poem Absolutely. out loud, to hear it read. Um, Karen Nanos has a question. She says, will there be a list of poems read tonight? I want to remember them all. Phyllis, you want to take that? Uh, yes, tomorrow we'll be sending everybody an email uh, that will contain both the link to this recording as well as a link to a gift package. It will be a document that has uh, all of the materials used tonight 
and then some. It's, I think, a 17-page document. So it's it's got a wealth of material in it and uh, lots of links. And so there will be much to chew on there. Mm -hmm. Hooray, she says. OK. <laughs> Leanne says, this has been powerful and wonderful and inspiring. You're also very talented and full of richness. Thank you for sharing with us. And that's such a kind thing to say, but you know, I, I have to say that we are nothing as writers and poets uh, without people who love to hear writing and poetry and stories and songs. And, and so the community that comes together in magical moments like this, I, it, is, it is just a privilege to be a part of. So thank you all for, for being here. I could say in uh, it kind of in the spirit of sh sharing light, sharing our own light, uh, tomorrow morning, my friend Sherry Riker Blue and I have a group we call Secret Agents of Change. And tomorrow we have a secret mission, Operation Wish. And if you want to join us, um, all you have to do is you can join our Facebook group, which is Secret Agents of Change. And um, Sherry and I will be on in the morning and we'll be giving out a secret mission for you to spread light into the world on the, on the next, the, you know, just on the day, the first day that the sun is longer, a chance to find that own our inner radiance and share that too. So I hope, I hope some of you will become secret agents. Rosemary, we have a question from Nan. Uh, you mixed song with your poetry reading. How do you decide where and when to include singing? Ooh, it shows up. <laughs> you know, I think I, I love the singing. Uh, I've, I'm lucky that I've, that I've always sung, not, you know, with, with groups of people by myself, of course, in the shower, in the car, but also I've been lucky enough to always find a community of people to sing with. And I think the poetry really does lend itself. It's, it, it's a bit like a song. Um, you know, it's lyrics are kind of poetry, I suppose. And I think it's kind of fun just to go in and out of them. I've always secretly wanted a band. <laughs> just so y'all know, if any of you ever want to be in a poetry band, I'm your gal. Let's do it. Let's just play and make a band. <laughs> Leanne has a question. Um, uh, first, you might want to plug your daily poem, uh, Rosemary. Um, and she's wondering how you find inspiration every day to write such powerful words. Oh, well, thank you for that. Um, I mean, my secret is to look out the window. <laughs> That's it. I mean, I just, I love paying attention all day. I think it's the same whether you're writing every day or, or not. I think that the only thing that's different about writing every day is that I have to lower my standards sufficiently as William Stafford said, and just know and trust that absolutely everything uh, is worthy of a poem. Absolutely everything. You know, Mary Oliver says in Wild Geese, the world offers itself to your attention. And I believe that's true, the whole world. Um, I don't know though about James, Phyllis. I mean, where, where are you finding your inspiration? It's more, go ahead. Oh, okay. I was just gonna say, I think it's similar uh, for me, Rosemary, that um, I'm a big believer that poetry uh, is meant to hold everything and that the container of a poem can hold so much. Um, and so much of what we think might not be the best subject for a poem too, that um, the, the so-called planar moments of life are, are grist for the poetry mill. And so I'm just always using, you know, much to my husband's chagrin sometimes, <laughs> uh, he, he gets veto power over, uh, over the work because uh, it is very personal. And, you know, sometimes I'm including parts of his own experience as well. Oh, is it, do, do, is it fair for us to ask how many poems get vetoed? Only one so far, so I think you're doing pretty well. <laughs> Very generous husband, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know how many of you out there struggle with perfectionism, um, but um, learning how, I, I, Rosemary, you say it very well, you know, 
let go of the need to be good and just try to be true. Uh, and I think that goes for any kind of writing, but especially with poetry, um, um, you know, if, if you can just embrace what comes in this moment uh, and not worry about it, not stew about it, just try to be true to what's appearing to you, um, the, the joy increases exponentially. Yeah, and I, I love what you say, Phyllis, about not worrying about how good it is, but but how true it is. I think, you know, it'll make you a better human to worry more about whether whether it's true to your own experience or true to what wants to be created than if it's going to get published by a certain magazine or if it's going to appear in a book someday. Um, you know, I don't know about you, Rosemary and Phyllis, but um, poetry and writing in general is a spiritual practice for me. It's, it's part of it. And so I, I consider that just part of what I do every day and just who I am. Getting published is not, not what I create for. Mm -hmm. Sharing, yes. And one of the things that I love about um, the pandemic, ironically, is that I found this new medium of sharing. Uh, you know, I live in South Dakota, which is not always the easiest place for, for me to live uh, in terms of my uh, convictions about life. Um, but with a virtual setting like this, uh, I know that we're going to be reaching somebody in Israel. I don't know where else other people are, you know, but, but you're not limited anymore. You can reach and you can find the, the kindred spirits uh, all around the world. And uh, that's, that's very uh, liberating. Uh, there's somebody from Canada. Woo, yeah, there you go. <laughs> also, I just got a backup singer for my band. That's my friend, Janet Leverwood, who doesn't live too far away from me. So. Well, I, I think we can recruit the whole band from the folks who are here tonight. So if you want to sign up, you know, just put it in the chat if you want to be the drummer or the guitarist <laughs> or the beat person, you know, whatever you want to do there. Uh, Nan is asking, uh, maybe this should be the last question because we want to share each of uh, us one more poem with you before we go tonight. Uh, she's asking, um, about whether I see storytelling as an extension of my poetry. Uh, storytelling is just part of somebody signed up to be a harmonica player. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, storytelling is a part of everything I do, whether I'm composing music or writing fiction, writing a poem, there's often narrative either embedded in the work or um, it, it serves as the cup for the work, or that is the springboard, the origin point for, for the, the work. Uh, I, I, I think my life is really uh, constructed around stories and, and it's enriched by hearing the stories of others. And so um, how we hear one another's stories and, and how we uh, let our own stories be impacted by the hearing uh, has a lot to do with the way we live in the world and the kind of world we're creating together. It's one way that, that we bring one another home, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's the part of the sparkles up in the sky. Uh, there, there's um, someone who has said that, um, you know, when we're born, we bring light with us from wherever that mystery is that we come from. And that light for the rest of our lives pours out of our mouths and pours out of our fingers and pours out the, the ends of our hair, you, you know, and it pours out of our stories. Yes, yes, we'd be careful there, Rosemary. <laughs> so yes, storytelling is very, very, very important to me. It's, it's the, perhaps the original medicine, I don't know. But uh, so we want to finish. I'm sorry if there are people's uh, uh, comments that we didn't get to. We value them all, but we also want to honor our uh, agreement with you and keep this uh, ending at seven. So we're going to go around one more time, one more poem for each of us. And thanks again to everybody for being here. Especially thanks to you, Phyllis, for thinking of the whole event and putting it all together and 
working with Eventbrite, making it all happen. Thank you. Thanks, Phyllis. Phyllis, by the way, is uh, um, this has the most incredible anthology. You can see the cover it right behind her. Poetry of Presence, such a beautiful book. And by the way, James has an incredible anthology, Healing the Divide also, and a new one coming out in April, which I'm very excited about. Well, I'm gonna close with a poem that I wrote. Um, it's, it's kind of a, a lull, it's like a song poem. I wrote it for a, a collection uh, in which a, a woman artist had made letters. This is for the letter R. And then in the image, she'd drawn a letter R made out of trees. And then it had lots of R animals and objects all throughout this image. And so my job was to put every R thing into a poem, which, you know, that's a fun way to write a poem. You end up with a lot of very random things. So your, your game, I suppose, as I read this poem is to listen for all the R words. And in the, um, in the handout that you'll get tomorrow, you can see the picture too. This is making peace with the darkness. You need not fear the night, my child. Evening comes to everything. It finds the raspberries by the road. It finds the rabbit in her hole. It finds the river and all its swells. The evening comes to everything. As silently as the rainbow bends, the evening comes to everything and the road runner stops his running and the honeybees stop their buzzing and the rattlesnakes stop their sunning as the evening comes to everything. As dark and graceful as raven's wings, evening comes to everything. Even the raindrops as they are falling and the rose of woodsy as it's blooming and the wily raccoon who goes exploring. Yes, the evening comes to everything. I used to fear the darkness too and I'd pray all night for morning but feel how evening holds the world, the animals, the boys, the girls, the moms, the dads, the plants, the birds. It holds us together and our differences blur. Oh, evening come to everything. Thank you, Rosemary. This is a year-end blessing called Promise. How to bless you these wild, precious days. Throw open the door before you knock. Receive every shade of who you are. Seat you at the table before you're hungry. Greet the light that shimmers in your chair. Pour your tea like ceremony. Wait upon the words you say like the soundings of a bell not rung since ancient times. Speak truth to you, keeping faith even when its sharp edge glistens. Help you walk the ground of your soul and soar the heavens of your mind. My joy in you overflows every cup. Not even sorrow or fear can hold it. In this world together by miracle or fate, we lean into its pleasures and pain. Each moment between us, a living shrine. I won't ask for your blessing. Already, it is mine. Well, thank you for that, Phyllis and Rosemary both. Um, I'm gonna close us out with a poem called Only Love. 
And it has an epigraph from the Buddhist teacher and writer, Sharon Salzberg. Only love is big enough to hold all the pain of the world. And I just wanna to say too that um, I mean love and I think she means love too, not in the saccharine sense of you know love, but um, a very active love, the kind of love and intimacy um, and honoring that take work and fight for justice and, and all of that. So this is only love. And so I imagine the entire earth as one beating heart held in the space of this universe, inside a larger body we can't fathom, filling with enough love to lead each of us out of the cave of our personal pain and into the light, enough love to lead all humans as one out of collective fear, rage, and hate into a place of peace that is found only within our uh, only within our own hearts, beating in sync with the pulse of this planet we were born to inhabit. Despite the daily storms which overtake us and make us forget, we are the lifeblood pumped into these veins. Every particle of love we generate, running into rivers, lakes, and creeks, evaporating into the air we breathe, give back and breathe again. Thank you, James. Thank you, Rosemary. Deep peace to everyone. Stay safe, okay, and celebrate being alive. <laughs>